Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines, where I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David's going to talk to us about some big bills he's gotten through Congress. Particularly, there's a waterways bill that's resulting in the dredging of a lot of our ports, more money to clear the Morganza spillway all the way down to the Gulf, and a lot of other things. Also, a transportation bill that's going to help our bridges and many other roadways. He's also going to talk about running for governor of the state of Louisiana in 2015. Join us on the next Legal Lines with United States Senator David Bitter. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Buy UM Insurance. Why? UM Insurance stands for uninsured or underinsured insurance coverage, and it's the only insurance you will buy that protects you in the event you're involved in an automobile collision and the other party who hits you and is at fault has either no insurance or minimal insurance. Remember in Louisiana, we only require to get a license and drive that you have at least $10,000 in coverage. So if you have $100,000 in injuries, but they only have $10,000 in coverage, you're out 90 grand, unless you've purchased UM insurance. So number one, buy UM insurance. You can waive it or select lower limits, but do not do that. So the Legal Lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is buy UM insurance. This has been Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David, thank you hey, so Locke. much. Hey, great, great to be with you. Thanks for the invite. It's great to see you again. Let's yeah. just dive in. Sure. I opened up the paper like we were talking about before. Yeah, quite a few things to talk about. I mean, huh? it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Let's talk about what's happening in Iraq. We yeah. fought there for 10 years, yeah. and, and it looks to be imploding. Uh, not just imploding, but it could be a terrorist haven. I mean, a state possibly with control of oil revenue, a lot of resources Terrifying. that could be a capital for terrorist training against the United States, against Israel. So it is terrifying. Explain, uh, because as I understand, it's almost like the country is, is getting divided up again. You know, yeah. you have the division of the population between yeah. Sunnis and Shiites. Right. Saddam Hussein, I believe, was a, a Sunni. Um, and, and Shiites are predominant majority in Iran. Right. Right. And and the government was kind of freezing out one part. Right. You had the Kurds over in another part. Right. Well, that is all going on, but overlaid on that is this development of an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. Right. So it's not simply factionalism, which might be bad enough in terms of instability. Interesting. But it's uh, overt terrorist activity, an Al-Qaeda offshoot uh, gaining momentum, advancing toward Baghdad, controlling large parts of the country. And when they have that sort of foothold, including possibly, if, if they're successful, on oil revenue and the ability to fund right. more activity and more attacks against us and more attacks against Israel, that's uh, really serious. It's a nightmare yep. scenario. Yeah, it is. Well, so, so in your view, is there a le legitimate division between the, this Islamic caliphate goal of these, yeah. these al-Qaeda operatives? in an opposition by Iran? Iran doesn't want that? Well, I think it is true that Iran doesn't want that, and they have interests on the other side because of the factionalism, because of their brand of Islam. However, having said that, you know, if our main um, a strategy to address this is talking to Iran, it shows you how bad a shape we're in, and, and it shows me, quite frankly, that we're not getting adequate leadership from the president. And you've mentioned a couple of times now the effect that it's going to have on energy oil. Yeah. Bottom line is we yeah. get a significant amount of our energy oil from the Middle East, and if these guys affect, in fact, yeah. the price bowl is already going yeah. up, it shows well, it could how do, vulnerable we abs are. Absolutely. It could do two things. First of all, it could spike the price of energy. Uh, secondly, and maybe even more worrisome, it could put enormous resources in the hands of terrorists to fund, to actively fund training and operations against America, against Israel, against the West. So both of those things are scary. Certainly it underscores, the first point at least underscores, how we need to continue to develop our new American resources. Absolutely. We can be, we should be truly energy independent with these new oil and gas resources we've found with new technology, directional drilling, et cetera. So we should take full advantage of that. That would help address the first point. Now, it wouldn't address the second, but it would help address the first point. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Sure. Same area of the, of the world. Yeah. Uh, I'm opening the papers and I'm seeing we yeah. got three folks kidnapped 
in Israel slash Palestine yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, one is a U.S. citizen, yeah. um, and and we've got bird dog. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just I'm going okay. We we exchanged five of the worst possible right. terrorists right. that we could have exchanged for a guy who seems to be a deserter, maybe a collaborator. Right. Predictions were that kidnappings would increase by terrorists right. because of this extraordinarily right. bad trade. Well, and Locke, not just predictions, but a few days after the trade, a, a Taliban spokesperson said was asked, you know, does this encourage you to do more of this hostage taking? And he said, absolutely. Absolutely, it makes all the sense in the world for us to do more of that. Now, I can't directly link the incidents in Israel and elsewhere to this trade, but clearly uh, the message to our enemies has to be that this is going to pay off, and clearly it has to encourage them to some extent. And, and the guys, the, the terrorists that we let go yeah. are being te treated like kings over there and yeah. have flat out one of them, I believe I read, said, Hey, I can't wait to get back, back in the Correct. fight. Correct. And our own intelligence community has said for at least four of the five, the chances are about nine out of ten, that they'll actively re-engage in the fight uh, for at least four of the five. And, and I'm reading, too, that you know the law, as it existed maybe a year or so ago, may not have allowed for this swap to have right. occurred, but it was changed, but it required 30 days' notice to Congress, and that yes. did not happen. Is that right? Correct. There are two legal issues that are significant, not to get tangled in the legal weeds, but they are important. First of all, the law requires notice to Congress. That wasn't followed, pure and simple. Now, the administration has made several different excuses about why they didn't think they could do that. The problem is they've been changing their story on that every other day. First, it was because he was deathly ill. Then they had to back away from that. Then it was because uh, they thought he would be killed if word leaked out. By the way, there's no intelligence to support that at all. I'm not saying it wasn't a tense situation and there weren't legitimate considerations like that. I am saying that the administration has been changing its story on that many different times to avoid living by the law. The second legal issue is just a year ago in the National Defense Act, we had an absolute prohibition against these sort of swaps. Uh, and that was supported by a clear bipartisan majority in the U.S. Senate. That language was not able to be put in the current National Defense Authorization Bill because Harry Reid shut down debate and amendments on the Senate floor. That was one of the direct casualties of the way he runs the Senate, shutting down amendments and votes. And I led a letter with many other senators to him saying, uh, this is a direct result of how you're running the Senate. We need to have open debates and an open amendment process. If we had, that same prohibition against these swaps would clearly still be the law. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you know, and in my head I'm going, okay, they're saying, and one of the reasons I heard was purportedly, we're not going to leave one man behind, which is very admirable right. as an American right. soldier. Um, the problem is, in my head I'm going, well, what about Benghazi? Yeah. I mean, why does, yeah. it, why does it just apply here in this circumstance with a yeah. deserter, but it doesn't apply with our, our United States ambassador. But, you know, that's largely a talking point, that line they have. Nobody wants to leave Americans behind under any circumstances. However, it's a different question when you're releasing five dangerous terrorists who are going to continue to plot and attack the United States. You need to consider the safety of all Americans, certainly that one American, no matter whether he was a deserter or not. I think you do need to try to get him back, but you need to consider the impact on all Americans. And as we see this ramp up, apparently, or this threatened ramp up of more hostage taking, it really calls all that into question. And I assume as it relates to Afghanistan, then uh, the position would be, let's don't do what we did in yeah. Iraq. Let's yeah. keep some folks there. All right. This is Locke Mayor with Legal Lines, our United States Senator David Bitter. We'll be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Document your claim. What do I mean? Whenever you present a claim, whether it's for injuries in an automobile collision or for a breach of contract case or a business claim, it all boils down to documentation and evidence. For example, when you go to trial, basically both sides are presenting their evidence of what they believe to be their case. 
For example, also, if you're involved in an automobile collision, document the event. Talk to all the parties who are involved. Get their names, address, contact information, insurance info. Talk to the witnesses on the scene. Also get their contact information. Take photographs with the phones we all have these days. Everybody can take a picture and that paints a thousand words. So document your claim. The Legal Lines tip from me, Lock Meredith, to you is document the claim. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David, let's dive right back Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're talking about this kind of pattern of information that doesn't seem to always make sense yeah. from, our, um, from the administration. Let's talk about the Boko Haram uh, right. situation. I'm not even right. sure everybody's going to know about that. That's yeah. the, the girls That's kidnapped. That's in Nigeria. That's this horrible terrorist group that ki kidnapped all these Nigerian schoolgirls, still holds them uh, at bay, probably forcibly uh, uh, converting them to Islam, so it's a horrible situation. And what really concerns me is the fact that the State Department for many years under Hillary Clinton dragged its feet, did not want to properly label this organization as a terrorist organization. Why? Well, I'm asking a lot of questions to try to figure that out. I have concerns, uh, and the dots that I see beginning to connect uh, is the fact that there are some ties to big donors to the Clinton Foundation not wanting this Nigerian group labeled as a significant terrorist organization because they were trying to lead uh, commercial developments in Nigeria and that would have hurt the effort. Good Lord. Uh, I'm, I, I can't prove that that was a huge motivating factor. It is there. There are those dots there. And I think we need a lot of answers to some legitimate questions about why the State Department uh, didn't follow the law and ignored uh, the warning signs that this was a serious terrorist organization for several years. And, and you are on the Armed Services Correct. Committee for the United States Senate, Correct. so you have access to the information that we're yeah. talking about. I yeah. want folks to understand that. Yeah. Now, to his credit, John Kerry, within a, a year of his becoming the Secretary of State, labeled this organization as a terrorist organization properly under the law. But the State Department under Hillary Clinton dragged its feet for many years, and we seem to be finding out that they did not properly and completely disclose information to Congress on this very issue for a couple of years. And I was reading that there were actually other governmental agencies that were flat out calling them terrorists. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure that this group should be called a terrorist organization. It clearly is one. It was ramping up activity, so there was a lot of pressure in that and, and being designated a terrorist group means what? Greater scrutiny, that we're going after them in different ways, freezing assets? All what of is the it? above. Okay. It means significant concrete action by the United States government. We've identified them as an enemy. Correct. Okay, excellent. All right, well, at least it's happening now. Yeah. Um, pray for the, the girls. Absolutely. Let's shift gears. Uh, sure. Russia. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. The bear is uh, growling big yeah. time. Uh, look, if anybody thought uh, peace was going to break out everywhere because the Cold War ended, clearly that hasn't been the case. The world changed a lot. Yeah. But I would not say uh, threats overall have lessened. In many cases, in many ways, they've multiplied and gotten more complicated. And Russia uh, certainly uh, is not a modern democracy with the same impulses to peace under Putin that we would have hoped after the fall of the Soviet Union. Look, I'm, look. I'm very concerned that um, our leadership, meaning President Obama's leadership, is only encouraging his worst behavior, doing nothing to push back on that behavior in Ukraine and elsewhere. Well, that's what I was going to bring up, is that let's discuss that issue where we have a country, Ukraine, yeah. new country, used yeah. to be part of Russia's group, right. uh, split away yeah. decades ago. Yeah. Russia marches in yeah. and takes over one of their big cities yeah. and, and basically has annexed it and said, they're part of Russia now. Right. And right. Too bad. Right. And uh, we've been able to do nothing about it. Now, look, that would be a tough situation under any circumstance. Well, and they had a military base. Yeah, right? Russia. I'm, I'm not suggesting we send boots on the ground. I'm not suggesting we go all in on a new war. However, I am saying very clearly that I think President Obama's foreign policy encouraged that sort of behavior, did nothing to discourage it, did nothing to give Putin second thoughts. My recall is the only consequence was there were a few individuals in the government were yeah. 
assets were seized and or Correct. they said you can't do business here anymore. Correct. That's been very slow and very halting. It's on an individual basis, not an economic sector basis, which a lot of us have been pushing for. And I'm reading that Russia is now telling the Ukraine, uh, we're shutting off your gas because they get their natural gas from yeah. Russia unless you come up with yeah. some cheese. Well, Money. Putin's big trump card in all of this, where you're talking, whether you're talking about Ukraine or all of Europe, is all of those folks' reliance on Russian energy. They're not energy in, independent, no, are they? No. And in particular, Russian natural gas. That's even an added reason, in my opinion, Locke, for us to ramp up as aggressively as we can American energy development, including natural gas, including LNG. That would be something that if we ramped up that activity, really put her on a fast track, exported LNG, put Europe at the top of the preferred list. Absolutely. That could really undercut Putin's power, be far more significant in the grand scheme of things than denying non-visas or having these very targeted uh, uh, attacks on individuals and not even sectors of the Russian We economy. protect ourselves from our Middle East enemies yeah. and we protect our friends. Yeah, absolutely. Unbelievable yeah. that, that I, don't, I can't understand yeah. why this stuff hadn't happened yet. Yeah. All right, let's talk about, um, you know, I know Russia and China have entered into trade agreements where they're basically kind of saying, you know, we're going to trade with ourselves. We're not using U.S. dollars. We're going to enter into our own deals. Yeah. Russia's done it with Iran. Yeah. Um, and, and I know that China also has butted heads with Japan over some islands. They're yeah. telling folks, hey, you got to contact yeah. us before you fly through our air, including yeah. you, United yeah. States. What's you know, going like on to here? me, what all this tells me, everything we've been talking about is that um, a vacuum is going to be filled. And if American leadership retreats, if we are less of a leader in world affairs, whether it's economically or in any other way, that vacuum is not going to just stay a vacuum. It will be filled usually by uh, evil or unstable influences. Folks, we don't want to have leading uh, world affairs like Putin, like communist China. And so um, uh, leadership abhors a vacuum, and that's going to be filled. So if we step away, the result is not going to be an improvement. We can see what happens. Yep. That's basically yeah. seems like what is happening. All right, let's shift gears a little bit, although to me still related. Yeah. We've got our borders that yeah. are being inundated yeah. with uh, illegal folks coming right. over. Um, I understand why they want to come here. America's yeah. the greatest country in the world. Yeah. But we've got these young children. Yeah coming yeah, in Mark, by the, the tens newest, of thousands. That's the newest way of this dramatic ramp up of unattended minors. Minors, kids under 18, many of them very young, with no parent, no adult. They're being smuggled in. They're being dumped in unattended. It's a real humanitarian crisis. They live through hell getting here, that's right. for one thing. Um, now, it, this issue has a lot of different facets, but I believe this is only being encouraged by our current uh, immigration stance and by the fact that really in many cases President Obama has said we're not going to enforce the law, we're not going to send anyone back. That's making it worse and not better. David, I'm so nervous too because I'm reading that they're having to let uh, former gang members from Mexico and other dr drug cartel personnel come in along with who knows else. We, yeah. We've got documentation that ter terrorists have come in yes. from our southern borders yeah. and so not only do we have this humanitarian crisis and the border is out of control and not protected and we're sub subjecting ourselves to greater harm. That's right and of course all that does is send out the message far and wide come on over your chances are very good at right. being able to get in and being able to stay so it's growing the problem. Problem is bad enough to begin with it's not only not solving it it's growing the problem. Unbelievable. All right well we'll continue this on the next sure. segment. This is Locke Merritt the Legal Lines. Our United States Senator David Vitter will be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. You often can see an attorney for free, at least on the first visit. Knowledge is power. Learn what it is that you're signing and the consequences of signing that document are. Remember, once you sign a settlement document, regardless of whether it's contractual, business claim, or personal injury claim, it's over. You will no longer have rights. You can no longer file a lawsuit. You better know what your consequences are. You better make sure you're being fully compensated. And remember, oftentimes, there are obligations that you have once you sign that contract. 
So from me, Locke Meredith, to you, the legal line's tip is never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, let's keep going. Absolutely. Uh, immigration. We're yeah. talking about how we're being inundated with yeah. folks coming in over our southern borders. Yeah. Kids are getting put on bus and planes and shipped to different yeah. cities, yeah. Arizona and different cities and even up north. Right. Um, and what and, are we doing about this? Uh, we're debating amnesty. We're debating whether we're going to move even more in the wrong direction, in my opinion. Like, can you imagine all of this going on? Can you imagine what the message would be if we pass so-called comprehensive immigration reform, which includes a big amnesty? I don't care what promises are made about enforcement. The message is going to be crystal clear. Come on over. The water is fine, if you will. Come on over. You'll be able to get in. You'll be able to stay. And, and we're going to take care of you. Yeah, and that is going to grow the problem. And Locke, that's not a guess. That is experience. That's exactly what happened in the last so-called comprehensive immigration reform. It happened to be on a Ronald Reagan. That's right. I remember. He signed the bill. He thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think it proved exactly the wrong thing to do because the promise was, we'll just do this once. We'll have real enforcement. And at then, the border. At the border, and then problem solved. Well, the amnesty happened immediately. The enforcement never fully happened. And instead of solving the problem, we quadrupled the problem. What was then three million illegals in the country is now 12 plus million. So we didn't solve anything, we quadrupled it. And so it's not that we are evil people that don't want to help these folks that are yeah. here. They're here and most of them are never going to leave and yeah. we understand it. Yeah. A bunch of them contribute to our society yeah. and culture yeah. and our economy. And we're, but, we're a country of immigrants. That's right. And I'm very proud of that and it's a very positive tradition of our country. But, but through <laughs> most of our history, we're a country of legal immigration not an open border, not a wide open border with the attendant problems that we're creating now. And we cannot afford as a country anymore to take care of more folks no. with, and, and give up jobs when we have such a huge historical high of folks unable to get a job and, Correct. and, Correct. and hold it. And so, so it's, so it's, so it's just a drain nuts. in terms of Americans searching for jobs. It's clearly a drain in terms of government spending, social services, education spending, healthcare spending, clearly an enormous cost there. Unbelievable. So all we're saying is, before we talk yeah. about these folks who are here illegally, right. Right. fix the border. Yes. None of this is going to happen over here, f dealing with immigration, until you guys secure the border. How do we make that yeah. happen? Like we've heard the promises before from Republicans and Democrats over and over and over. Promise isn't good enough because it's never been fulfilled. That's right. We need a step-by-step -step approach. And step one is not just promising enforcement, but performing enforcement, showing a commitment. Now, there are other steps we need to get to. I'm not saying those other things are off the table, but it needs to be step-by-step, -step, and we need to prove out enforcement and not just promise it for the 10th time. And, and David, I'm even recalling the whole virtual fence thing, yeah. millions, billions yeah. of dollars allocated for a fence, virtual fence, yeah. whatever. That it never happened. Has never fully happened. It has happened in select cases and select areas. And by the way, it's worked in those areas. Clearly never fully happened. And the federal government's telling the states, hey, states who live with right. these people coming in across yeah. your southern border, you can't you, do, you anything can't do anything about it. About we're it. gonna be the ones, and yeah. if you try, we're gonna sue you, which right. they've done. Yes, and so the feds are abdicating their responsibility and to sort of add insult to injury, as you're suggesting, stopping states from taking action themselves. Unbelievable. All right, let's shift gears again. Sure. Um, because it's in the context of we have the greatest men and women on yeah. earth in our military. Yeah, They've made their families and they have made the huge sacrifice. And we just celebrated Memorial Day. And this VA scandal, yeah. it's just incredible. It's, it's outrageous. Uh, you know, Rock, uh, Locke, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the National World War II Museum mm -hmm. for the 70th, 70th anniversary of D-Day. And there were about 17 veterans there of the D-Day invasion. They were either there on that day or soon thereafter. And of course, those guys are far know, and few are between. Far and few between now. But it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion, a wonderful celebration. But the most important way we can honor them is attacking this VA scandal and really fixing that, because that 
is an outrage. And, and so as I understand it, um, there's a is there a bill that's now passed by House and Senate? There is. Sitting uh, in similar front of the bills. President? It's going to what's called Reconcil a conference okay. committee, work out the differences. I'm very hopeful that's going to be done in short order, in, in a matter of a couple of weeks, and then be signed by the president. And so the goal of that is to reduce waiting times, and the way that's going to happen is what? Well, the Senate bill does, I think, three big, big things. One thing, which isn't the biggest, but I've been working on for a while, has a direct Louisiana impact, is to move forward with uh, two VA clinics in Louisiana, in Lafayette and Lake Charles, that have been stuck in the mud in the VA bureaucracy for several years for no good reason. And we also move forward with 26 clinics total nationwide. Second thing is- And you a, had to fight for that, oh, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, I mean, you, been, it wasn't an easy thing. You, months, David Vitter, did it. It's been months of fighting. I've literally gone to the Senate floor eight times to try to push this through. We finally got it through. Second thing is a big national reform. And it is really for the first time ever to give veterans a choice card and to say, if you're either more than 40 miles from a VA facility, or if you're not getting seen in the in appropriate amount of time, then you have a choice. You can take your card. You can see other providers, either Medicare providers or federally qualified health centers or other providers. Choice. Private guys? For, yes, private guys for the first so time. So they're not ever. stuck in the system. No, so they have an option. Relegated to one system waiting. That's Nine a big deal. In some cases, that is a big deal. And then the third big reform is to give the new secretary of the VA real authority to fire incompetent people or people who are doing worse. Uh, they, he doesn't have that adequate authority now. He will soon. David, I know too that these military folks, and that's wonderful. And I guess I'm shifting gears thinking about our vets because they truly are the most wonderful. Yeah. They come back and they can't get jobs. Yeah. Yeah. What are we doing to help folks get jobs right now? Yeah, well, we're not doing enough because a lot of those vets, you're right, come back to a very uncertain future. Uh, obviously, a lot come back with horrendous injury as well, uh, a lot of amputees, et cetera. So we're not doing enough. The VA is trying to address that, but fundamentally, uh, the, the most important way to address that is to get a real recovery going and That's have right. real vibrant job growth. All right. And part of my fears when I watch the whole VA scandal take yeah. place is this is what Obamacare is going to become. Well, I'm glad you said that, and I hope people are understanding that lesson. The VA is the biggest example of a government-run health care system in the United States. I don't think it's a coincidence that these problems showed up in that system. This VA issue is instructive about Obamacare. All right, we're, we're going to continue and do an, another show, ladies and gentlemen. But for now, this is Lock Mayor of the Legal Lines. Our United States Senator, David Vitter, thank you for being with us.